The Eno Saris Show is sponsored by Fieldwork Brewing Company. With eight taproom locations in Northern California, Fieldwork brings you fresh craft beer direct from the source. Fieldwork will also ship beer direct to your door if you live in California. Visit fieldworkbrewing.com. You know, Eno Saris, I everybody knows you're brilliant. Everybody knows you're a great writer and you do all this stuff in Major League Baseball that dazzles everybody. But let's be honest, people really want to know it's hot outside. What is the beer to drink when it's hot? I mean, hot because, you know, a real thick IPA. I, I mean, and right now it's hot out. Well, I'm sitting by the pool. What, what, what should I be drinking? You know, I think that things get uh, super sweet uh, when it's hot. Like, you don't want to have something super sweet. I'm not that big into, like, uh, the super sweet drum rum drinks or anything. I want something to be crisp and refreshing. That's the words I'm looking for. And, in fact, uh, lagers can get kind of sweet. There's a lot of sweetness to them. So I would recommend a Pilsner. That's got a little bit of bitterness to it. It's got a little bit of uh, freshness to it. But it also, you know, 4.5% or so, so it's not super alcoholic. So... I've been I've been having more pilsners recently, and they they go down real smooth. I like it. All right, <clears throat> uh, have you come to grips with, and have you started writing writing the piece yet that Zach Geloff may be the best baseball player you've ever seen? <laughs> no, I, I love it. What's well, it's kind of interesting is that to have uh, Zach right next to Soderstrom. They both are similar players in that they hit the ball hard. Um, they have a good sense of the zone. They're athletic, and uh, and uh, they strike out a little bit. Uh, both of them do. And uh, I thought it was interesting just to 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 have these guys next to each other and just see, uh, you know, with similar strikeout rates, similar walk weights, similar underlying skills to how how different a career can start. You know, it's just it has been more struggle bunny for Soderstrom and uh, just lights out for, for Zach. And I feel like, I think, you know, they're both really good talents long-term and they'll both figure it out. And, and Zach will have days where it doesn't look as good, you know, cause he does strike out, but that's not possible. Um... That's not, <laughs> this kid hits everything. He He's foul pole to foul. You know, it's a pretty amazing. He is foul pole to foul pole. He can launch him out to right center. He can pull it, but he pulls balls down the line for a double he smacks it down the right field line. For, I mean, he literally can hit it anywhere on the field. And you have to admit, in modern-day baseball, and with all these kids coming up, where everybody's so pole-happy and trying to launch it, that's why we had shifting in the first place, he'd be this guy that, like, you shift on him, you can't. It's really impressive to watch a young player come up and honestly be able to hit the ball everywhere. Yeah, I, yeah. I think. I think the big, maybe the difference between Tyler and him is that Tyler has actually hit balls harder than, than Zach this year. He has more hard, like you know, more 110 plus, you know, Zach hasn't hit one uh, over 110 yet, but Tyler's been hitting them on the ground and Zach's been, Zach's been launching them. So, you know, sometimes it happens where a guy who has had the ability to lift the ball in the past comes to the major leagues and can't lift it. And I, I don't always have the answer for you. Maybe they're, low ball hitters or the way they're getting pitched. Uh, but uh, yeah, Zach just looks amazing. It's been really fun to watch. It's been a, it's been a lot of fun to watch. It's kind of been a saving grace here in this season. And for Tyler, no matter what, he's 21 years old. I yeah. actually, when people say he's a young player, I go, yes, he's a young, I'm tired of people calling 24 and 25 year olds young, but at 21 years old at a high school, I got to tell you, for me, just the experience having him up here, it's like what Jim Leland told us years ago. Hey, if you send a guy down and he doesn't come back, that's on him. Legit players will be legit players. So uh, to me, I, I, I keep him up here. He's going to struggle. That's fine. But don't you think the experience of getting, being in the big leagues, being on the plane, traveling, playing against the best players well, in the world, this is just great for him? Yeah, actually, you know what's great for him is the struggling. It's weird. I, you know, I think that a lot of kids will come through their high draft picks. They were the best player in their high school. They were the best player in their college, wherever they've been the best player in double A and single A all the way up. You know, I think sometimes just getting smashed in the mouth a little bit is like, okay, yeah. you know, it, it makes you kind of think about, 
uh, your process, your coaching, what you've done. Have you become complacent? Have you just been doing the same thing you did since high school? You know, do you need to, you know, revamp? Um, and so, you know, I think that can, that can be super useful. And yeah, to your point about what's young, uh, 26 by a lot of people is peak age. So I don't see how you could be young at 24, 25, if 26 is the peak age. In oh my God. You, you have no idea what my world is like, you know, you have no <laughs> idea. All these young players and you're like, what? These guys aren't young. We've I got mean, a, it, we got a soccer player here in San Jose who just signed, what was he, 16 years old? We've got we've got young girls competing on the LPGA tour coming over from Korea who are 16, 17 years old. And I'm not and obviously baseball. We're signing kids in the Dominican at 16 and 15. We've got guy, I mean, by the time you're 23, 24, 25, and and we've talked about this, we don't want to pay you after 30. So what is this window that you have? I, mean, right, yeah. I just think you're broadcast. young till you're 25 and you're old at 30. Oh, boy. I just think our media just doesn't get it and they don't want to adjust. I just think that's the problem. I mean, to be fair, if you're talking about regulars uh, in terms of regulars that, you know, have at least 100 plate appearance, uh, plate appearances this year, hitters that are under 23, there's only 15. Uh, so, you know, I guess you could still be green at, at 23, 24, but, um, pretty hard. The trend, the trend in the game is definitely towards younger. And, you know, if, if you are young at 23 and 24, then you're only young for like two years. It's kind of weird. And, and, and what a lot of people don't talk about, cause I think they just don't know is how much baseball these kids play now. It is mm-hmm. far more from that, even from my generation. I mean, I'm and, and you can go back to people now. We're talking about 50s, 60s, 70s. I'm talking about a kid who grew up in the 80s and the 90s. They now, with all the travel ball and all the tournaments and the fact that they don't they don't want you playing multiple sports, that most of these kids now just play baseball growing up, they have far more innings pitched. One of the reasons why we have so much Tommy John, and they have far more at bats, far more games played, far more competition than the previous generations of baseball players. So just by that, they are they are more experienced by the time they get to 23, 24 than what previous generations. So you got to be ready to rock, man. And I, I'll give like Soderstrom a 21, yes. But I start hearing 24, 25, and I go, uh, you're out of your mind. But, you know, you just went to an analytics conference. Before I ask you how the conference went, Please explain to me who goes to these conferences. Well, one of the big way, one of the big uh, attendees are teams that are looking for new analytics talent, and they go uh, and they interview people that that are submitting and present presenting at these conferences for analytics. Uh, so it's like the winter meetings, then. Yeah, it's like the winter meetings for nerds. Yeah, it's it's more like. Uh, uh, like the 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 Mariners were there, and uh, my old pal Dave Cameron from Fangraphs was uh, was running interviews, you know, left and right, and was 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 talking to young kids and and uh, uh, giving them a chance. So, you know, what you know, if you get on the schedule uh, and you get to present, then that's a, a, a tremendous opportunity to to catch the eye of a team. And then you know, some of the uh, yeah, it's also like the winter meetings. You know how at the winter meetings they have the um, the trade show. Yeah, where like people are trying to get you to to buy their different you know good gadgets or you yeah. know whatever services. Uh, there's a little bit of that where uh, there's a guy named Jimmy Buffy uh, who uh, runs Reboot, uh, and he was he presented and it was almost just like an ad for his services where he was like you know this is what we do we you can upload video into our into our thing and we'll give you a whole biomechanical breakdown of your picture and we can do this at scale and we can do it quickly. Uh, and he kind of then he went into some of the uh, nuts and bolts of his biomechanical model of pitchers. Uh, and he showed us that he can easily tell you, oh, this pitcher compared to other pitchers, uh, you know, doesn't like doesn't flex his knee enough or, you know, uh, is it doesn't like rotate his shoulder enough. And so they had these biomechanical markers and they can show you where your pitcher sits on this and where good is and where bad is and kind of highlight it's a, it's things a rip, for your pitcher to work on. It's a rip off of golf. Golf's been doing that for years. It's it's, like, yeah. it's so amazing how 
Baseball, can they give you just like a readout and be like your shoulders oh, too they, open? Your they, they can they can take your body. You'll be faceless, and they take take your body and they can put your exact swing and all the numbers and everything next to anybody. Tiger Woods, Phil Mickelson, Jordan mm-hmm. Speed. Yeah, they can do that. Golf's been doing all this stuff that baseball people are now trying to act like. Oh, it's new. These are shiny new tools. Now I'll ask you this: like the reboot, are they trying to sell it to teams? Or are they trying to sell it to consumers or both? Well, you also have uh, college people presenting there. And sometimes uh, college uh, colleges uh, will act as consumers, you know, as well as uh, as major league teams. But, it, you know, it's never directly to people. Um, you know, I don't think because uh, really the, the, the most the, the people who care the most about these sort of things are often kids. And so, yeah. I mean, you know, it's kind of hard. Consumers. Are you going like, to get the parents in there to see this and pay for it? it, 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 it they're, they're marketing to organizations, whether it be college or major leagues. Because, you know, TrackMan, TrackMan realized if we're going to make a lot of money. We got to get Johnny Hack paying for it because Johnny Hack's got the money. So now guys on the range got TrackMan's on their phone. That's where TrackMan TrackMan hasn't made their money selling it to baseball teams. TrackMan's made their money now in sports selling it to consumers. So I just wonder about that because, you know, technology, parents are the ones with the money. Parents want parents think little Johnny's going to be special, even though little Johnny's probably not going to be. But the parents will shovel out a a, a boatload of cash. Yeah, there's a lot of of stuff going on with that. Yeah, Uh, a lot of amateur coaching and stuff like that. When you're at the winter meetings for nerds, as you said, um, you know, in your life, you thought, you know, being a rock star, women are throwing themselves at you. Is it weird for you being the rock star at the winter meetings for nerds and the nerds are throwing themselves at you? It was, I uh, know, it's great. I mean, there's, it's just kids coming up and, you know, you're, you're probably like a rock star at this place. Well, kids, kids coming up and, and, and being like, you know, oh, I love stuff plus. And, you know, what's <laughs> funny though is, when, when you're when you're you know when you're among this quality of people the way that they show their uh admiration sometimes is they come up and they say i found a problem with stuff plus and i ran some models and you know i think you're doing this part wrong and i can show you if you want and <laughs> that's yeah. that's the that's the equivalent of can i get your signature <laughs> i mean yeah. can we collaborate on this you know research because I've, I've shown you i can i can show you something you've done wrong so uh, I, that you was know, uh, you know that what was I definitely really something that happened. <laughs> have me show up to this and say, guys. Obviously, all of you are doing stuff that I don't know about and I don't care about. But let me let let Townie give you a life lesson here. Nobody, and I mean nobody in life, likes the guy who acts like he's the smartest guy in the room. Nobody mm-hmm. likes that guy. You may be the smartest guy in the room. But if you play it the right way, everybody will love you. Everybody will want to hire you and everybody will buy your product. But when you go up to like Eno Saris, for anybody out there who's watching this, and you want to go, hey, pal, I think your stuff's not right and I'm smarter and I'll help you make it better. And no one likes that guy. No, one. No, he did. Ever, he did. Ever he did like great. That. He did it great. He said, you know, you're on your own podcast talking about change ups and sinkers and how they're tough to do and stuff plus. And I have an idea as to why. You know, and so he was nice about it. There were some presentations that were surprisingly along that lines. And you kind of want to be like, dude, you, you know, what are you doing here? But, you know, what's, what was interesting at this conference is we also had coaches presenting and we had coaches presenting from uh, colleges saying, like, how do I use analytics in my conversations with players? Uh, we had a coach from a D3 college talking about how she uses analytics uh, to coach her uh, her base runners. And, you know, how to put things, how to how to phrase things, how to, uh, you know, she said she did have one student who was a student of actuary science, which is like, you know, an accountant type uh, who did want to know all the super nuts and bolts about all of the different numbers that went into it. Uh, But she said for the rest, there's a there's a way to sort of chew it up, uh, you know, and make it as understandable, which is something I've always wanted to do is like make it accessible for people. But uh, in terms of like uh you know highlights for me on the on this one uh not all of them were like the, the as super nerdy as you might expect one of the highlights was amazing dr alan nathan is the, uh, one of these guys who's been studying the bat to ball collision he's a professor professor of physics he worked on the on the when the ball was juiced he was on the on the committee that was supposed to look into it and he found 
uh, something that I've heard from hitters before, and I cannot believe he proved it's true. And he said that some bats sound better and perform better based on their sound, and he could prove it. And he said that uh, bats that have a higher sound when you tap them, especially you can take a ball and hold the handle and you sort of tap the sweet spot or whatever, uh, the balls that have a higher sound produce higher exit velocities. There's something about the frequency, the way that the bat is, the, the, bat, the way the bat sort of vibrates that produces better outcomes. And so he said, like, you can hold the handle of your ball and, you know, a little bit less than halfway down the bat, sort of ping it with the ball and whichever one of your bats has the higher uh, frequency is the better bat for you to use that day. <laughs> this, only, this only works for wood, right? Yeah, it's definitely a wood thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense, right? Not every tree is the exact same. You're dealing with, I mean, with metal bats, you're getting the same manufactured metal bat pretty stamp. much yeah. going down the assembly line, right? But woods, a wood, obviously, see, that's something I'd be interested in because I'd be like, yeah, I, that, you're dealing, all, all bats are, there's different types of wood that you're using. There's different types of stain. There's, I, I, I totally, tell, I'd love something like that. That's interesting. And what was really cool about it for me too was that the the test, the thing you had to do was so low tech and so easy to do. It reminded me of when we were talking about the spin, you know, uh, having a good sticky stuff test and like how one might just be stick a wiffle ball on there. And if the wiffle ball doesn't fall off, then they're in trouble. You know what I mean? Like this is, you hold a bat up in the air, you take a ball and you sort of ping the, the bat and whichever one sounds higher, you got it. everyone, nobody, you don't even have to have a perfect pitch to do that. If it's just, you, you know, higher, you know, higher is better. So yeah, I, I love that one. Um, a little bit more, uh, along the nerdy side was, um, someone that kind of, uh, uh, that looked at basically tried to look at a player's development process and, you know, what he's worth to the team and what, what he costs the team. And he tried to solve for everything except for that player's development to be like, what is that player's development worth? Um, and the number he came out with was basically uh, over six years for every player is around $300,000. So Ooh. you could be like, <clears throat> that's how much money we should spend on coaching players. Maybe a little bit less if we want to make money, but like we should like a, a player, if he's, if his development is worth $300,000 over six years, we should be spending near $50,000 on every player every year coaching them. I guarantee you no organization in baseball is spending that much because you have to think about it. It's fifty thousand dollars. I'm talking about if you have a pitching coach, you don't get uh, uh, all of the pitching coach's salary. He coaches a bunch of people, so you're taking a tenth of the pitching coach's salary. You know, so I, I don't think that there's any, there's nobody out there who's giving their pitching coach in high A five hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that's going to go over well with college programs too and their budgets these days. Uh... Well, well, no, they're spending it. You know, my buddy Max well, Weiner in the SEC, the they may there. be in the Big Ten. But yeah. you, you get away from non-football conferences. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but um, quick, two things quickly. I know, I know you got to get out of here. Um, and it's just an observation. Being married to a teacher. Every single human being learns differently. And maybe the biggest problem that we still have to this day is that you've got unbelievable numbers. You've got unbelievable athletes. We just don't have that middleman to tr truly teach each individual player based on how they learn. Because we all learn differently, right? <laughs> That's been proven that all human beings, we all process things and learn differently. Maybe the problem is in baseball, we don't have somebody who knows how to teach everything to the players, to each individual, each individual player, how they learn and how they get stuff. Yeah, I've got a couple of responses to that. One is... Uh, just that I, I, you know, there's some people don't like it. Some people like it, but the one thing I like about the giants brand of baseball is that they have like 15 coaches and why do they have 15 coaches? They have, they literally have 15 coaches because one guy might get through to you and the other 14 don't, you know, that's, it's, True. it's almost yeah. like you're talking about, you, she, you, you're talking about, she, you, she's a, a teacher, you know, the number of teachers per every player every kid in your classroom not every player every kid in your classroom that that's a that's a number that ratio student teacher ratio is an important thing in in educational concepts so that's a part i like 
a part that uh, it might surprise you, there was a presentation by Dan Blewett, um, who uh, he, he was talking about how um, he's seeing less and less intelligence out of like, and not like smart intelligence, but like sports intelligence, like baseball playing intelligence out of players uh, these days. And he says that it has to do with how we train and how we think about things on the, even all the way down to the youth level. And he said that basically what you have is that um, we are now basically teaching the kids to, to the test in a way where it's like, oh, we want exit velocity. You know, the things that they, if you think about perfect game, what do they want a perfect game? Exit velocity, launch angle, barrels, uh, pitch velocity. You know what I mean? Like those, they, there are these metrics. And then you sort of, you, you overcoach these, these kids into these, these metrics and not like winning the game, not, not, not like making the winning play. And not like, he, one of his examples was nobody in college, no catcher in college calls his own game. There's no no catcher in college. And part of that is, you know, there's money in this, right? So if you're, you know, one of those big conferences you're talking about, I, I'm not going to let that catcher, you know, lose my job for me, you know? So I'm going to call every pitch for him. But, you know, there are consequences for that where you have players that, you know, the cards where you're looking at the card to know where you should play, you know, the earlier that shows up, the less you ever think for yourself. And you get to the big leagues being like, I don't know where to position myself unless I got a card on my wrist, you know, and that's happening. You know, you go down to the college and that goes, that starts happening younger and younger and younger where they're just told what to do and how to play. And Dan was like, you know, what's missing is nobody is going to the local lot and just playing. You know, and, 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 you know, it's it's a little over supervised. And that's that's just a general thing that's happened in our society. And, you know, we, we you know, even I, you know, more of a helicopter parent than my parents were or whatever, you know, but I would love it if my kid was called his friends and said, let's put together a baseball game and just went and played it because that's that's where you learn. You learn from the playing and especially even unsupervised playing because nobody's telling you what to do and you got to figure it out. I feel vindicated. Cut up that entire answer. I feel. <laughs> I've been saying, you know, we don't know how to play the game. There's an actual game to be played. We're yeah. so we're so focused on the process. I've been saying this over and over again, and I think people think I'm a moron, but I've been saying this. In sports, you have an actual game that you have to play. That all the stuff that you're learning, it, 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 it you have to play the actual game. It's like it's like in football, you'd be talking about all these fancy stuff. At some point, it's third and one, and you've got to get one yard, right? It's 90 feet away, runners at third, you need to get him in. However you get him in, it doesn't matter how you get him in, you need to get him in. Or pitcher's fielding practice, guy hits a little ground ball or a bunt, we've got to field it and go to the right. None of that has to do with any of the analytics. There's a way to play the actual game, and it doesn't matter what level you're at. There's a way to play the game, and these kids, they're trained better, they're better athletes, they're bigger, they're stronger, blah, 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 blah. They don't know how to play the game. They don't know the rules. It's just like they don't have instincts. They don't have base running instincts. They throw to the wrong bases. They just do little things that don't win games, that cost you games, and I'm seeing it. At the big league level, and people try, and let's get back to calling them young. People try to go, oh, they're young. No, they're not trained right. They're not coached right. They're not trained right because we're all focused on the process. That's why I bring golf into it all the time. It's like we're so worried about these guys being on the range, hitting it 800 yards, but all of a sudden you get into onto a golf course, you actually got to play the course. And short game mm -hmm. matters and putting matters and all this stuff. It's like baseball. We can sit there and all take BP and launch them out of the ballpark, but at some point you got to play the real game. Uh, quickly to that, you mentioned the Giants. We did this thing with a bunch of our buddies who are diehard Giants fans. A lot of them are guys that I played with, so they're ex-baseball players. Giants are having a pretty good season. They, they've had a couple of tough losses here, Rangers, and, of course, last night. No one likes the way they play. Like, even I, my doctor, who's a diehard, and he's a numbers guy, All the everybody we reached out to was like seven or eight people, small sample size, but we went, how do you like just the way they play and the way they play it like a chess game? And we manage, we manage every out. And everybody said, I hate it. It's weird. It's like, so it's basically showing me that if you're not entertaining, 
wins cannot be enough. And we all know that attendance is not where it should be. Ratings aren't where it should be. What do you think about just the style of play for the Giants? Just for a lot of people, it doesn't suit the uh, the regular fan's eye. Yeah, it is really interesting because if you look at the numbers only and you talk about, you know, what drives attendance, the number one driver of attendance is quality of team. So you should see an attendance boost for winning. And we just haven't quite seen that. Even though they won 107 games, the most in franchise history, or the most in San Francisco history uh, two years ago. And even though, once again, they're in second place and uh, the, the, the second wild card and, and, and totally in it, we're not quite seeing the same uh, attendance boost you'd expect to see. I mean, there was a time when the previous uh, San Francisco Giants had like what was like 300 sellouts in a row. You know, and we're definitely not back to that. So I don't know if something is, uh, you know, there was a bit of an X flux of people after COVID there, you know, San Francisco itself is not the same draw in terms of work. People do more work from home in Northern California. People have moved out of, you know, living that close to San Francisco. I wonder if there are some sort of population demographic changes that have had something to do with this, but you have to put that up against the style of play that has changed so much between the Sabian group and the Farhan group that, you know, you have to think that there's that some part of it. And then it's just not fun. Even as a writer, I say, you know, like, Oh my God, you took that guy out when, and you know, and then you have to talk to these players and you know that not all of them are hundred percent into it. You know, you know, this just, I can't tell you who it is because this is off the record stuff, but like, you know, that, that some of these players are rolling their eyes at this stuff, you know, and they're like, well, you know, whatever it takes to win or whatever, you know, like, grumble grumble but you know uh, it, it's the what they've done is take you know found a way to take the most out of veterans and and put the, a bunch of veterans together in a in a in a way to win games it's it, it does suck alex wood is coming in in the sixth for three or he's coming in in the second for four or you know you got ross stripling is he starting is he following you know you never really know what's going and, and one of the nice things about the Sabian group was you knew who was starting tonight. you knew who started tonight you knew he'd go three or four or five. You know, if you wanted to buy a jersey for, you know, uh, whoever it was at the time, that they would be there for a while. You know, it's more of that, like, you know, uh, these are the, these are the, this is the core, and we know who it is, and they're going to be here for a while. I wonder how much of this is temporary, as they try to improve their 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 mind league system and get better players that'll be here and play every day. But as much as we are excited about Casey Schmidt. And then Luis Matos, they've both gone back down, you know, and, you know, other than Patrick Bailey, I don't know. We're still looking for kind of like a everyday star, you know, Zach Geloff type, you know, to come up and like, you know, take our attention and, and stick with it. So I don't know if it's just a coping mechanism. Uh, you know, this is the best way they can win games right now. Or if uh, this is something that's here for the long haul and they're just going to have to get used to it. He is the sexiest man at the winter meetings for nerds, ladies and gentlemen. The great Eno Saris from The Athletic. Play his clothes. The Eno Saris Show is sponsored by Fieldwork Brewing Company. With eight taproom locations in Northern California, Fieldwork brings you fresh craft beer direct from the source. Fieldwork will also ship beer direct to your door if you live in California. Visit fieldworkbrewing.com. Next week, we'll go over the algorithms that I have for Stuff Plus, okay? Yeah. <laughs> oh, good, good. Thanks. You got your own? <laughs> I've been staying up late working on it, you know. <laughs> Take care, Thanks buddy.